Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Khalil Kotap, I'm the Director of Education here at the New Haven Museum. We're very happy to have you here today for our talk. Um, <clears throat> in a moment, uh, our Director Margarita will be on uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, and we have a special guest to help us with the introduction of the programs tonight. Um, so, Margaret Ann. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Margaret Ann Tarkashinsky, Executive Director of the New Haven Museum, and we are so glad to have you with us this evening as we celebrate the 300th birthday of Roger Sherman, Connecticut's founding father. Our speaker this evening, Mark David Hall, believes less famous founders like Sherman must be studied if we are to have an accurate account of the founding era. And he will tell you about the many accomplishments of our great statesman, who also served as New Haven's first mayor. I'd like to welcome um, Sherman family descendants who have joined us tonight. And I hope all of you will put your comments in the chat and share. Roger Sherman was born in Massachusetts, but he made his home in Connecticut after the death of his father. We're fortunate here in Connecticut to have two historical societies that have permanent exhibits and collections devoted to Sherman, the New Milford Historical Society and the Sherman Historical Society. And I'd like to welcome John Jenner from the Sherman Historical Society to say a few words about their Robert Sherman Learning Center. Hi, John. Hi, Margaret. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. As you mentioned, Roger Sherman moved from Massachusetts to New Dillaway, Connecticut in 1743 with his mother and five siblings after his father had died. He came with the uh, trades of farming and shoemaking, which he had learned from his father. And while living here, he decided to uh, learn surveying. He taught himself because he wanted to afford to be able to send his young siblings to a formal education beyond the limited six years which he had enjoyed himself. Uh, in 1802, the state of Connecticut was petitioned by the citizens of the northern part of uh, New Fairfield, Connecticut, to separately charter the northern seven miles, which they did. And the residents here decided to name their new town Sherman in honor of their most famous resident. The Sherman Historical Society has continued to honor Roger Sherman, particularly through the exhibits that we have that relate to the trades which he practiced while he lived here. Our barn on the main part of our property in the center of Sherman uh, has recently been undergoing a major restoration and when that's complete, the farm exhibits will be returned to it and they will honor the first of his trades. We have also inherited a building from the original Roger Sherman farm. And in it, we have a permanent exhibit of shoemaking and surveying the other two trades which he practiced while he was here. Uh, our most recent uh, effort with, that honors Roger Sherman is the Roger Sherman Learning Center, and it is housed in the Northrop House Museum and Headquarters here on our main property. And uh, it has a computer research center. It has an exhibit of the documents and memorabilia which we own, which relate to Roger Sherman. It has furnishings, which range from very humble country furniture to a magnificent high boy, which represent his uh, start as a, in humble origins. And he rose to a position of great wealth and prominence. 
as his life uh, moved on. Uh, the main feature of this uh, learning center is a 10 foot by five foot timeline, which depicts the major elements uh, of, and accomplishments of his life over the period uh, in which they occurred. And one of them, as you mentioned, is the, he was mayor of New Haven for quite a number of years. Um, he and his brother started the first of their stores in New Milford, Connecticut, which as most of you know is near Sherman, a little uh, west and north of New Haven. And uh, that the Sherman Historical Society owns the old store in Sherman, Connecticut, where we further honor Roger Sherman with a permanent old store museum, uh, revolving exhibits, and a very nice gift shop. So we hope uh, that encourages you to pay a visit to Sherman. Uh, I would love to hear from you, and you can contact me on my email, John Jenner at gmail.com, that's J-O-H-N-J-E-N-N-E-R at gmail.com. And I would be very pleased to hear from you and to arrange for your visit later on this year when we are again open. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret Ann. John, for being with us. Um, now I'd like to um, welcome our speaker. Mark David Hall is the Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics and Faculty Fellow in the Honors Program at George Fox University. He is also an Associated Faculty Member at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University and a Senior Fellow at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion. Yes. He earned a BA in political science from Wheaton College and a PhD in government from the University of Virginia. He has written, edited, or co-edited a dozen books. Among them, Did America Have a Christian Founding? Separating Modern Myth from Historical Truth, Great, Great Christian Jurist in American History, America and the Just War Tradition, A History of U.S. Conflicts, Faith and the Founders of the American Republic, Roger Sherman and the Creation of the Re American Republic, and Americans Forgotten, America's Forgotten Founders. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege. I usually, when I speak about Sherman, I complain that no one knows who he is, but I suspect with this audience, um, everyone knows who he is, and that's wonderful. And to have Sherman descendants in the audience that's just fantastic and i look forward to hearing some of your stories so as you all know particularly sherman is literally the only founder to help draft and sign the declarations and resolves the 1774 document the articles of association the declaration of independence the articles of confederation the u.s constitution and the bill of rights and yet, like I said, very few Americans know who he is. Maybe sometimes in textbooks they mention that he put together the Connecticut Compromise with Oliver Ellsworth, but usually most people can't say much more than that. So what I wanna do is just provide an overview of his life and his contributions to the founding of our nation, and also explore a few reasons why he's not better known today. I, I suspect again with this crowd, um, you all are already celebrating the 300th anniversary of his birth. Um, but if you weren't doing it before now, hopefully by the end of this talk, you will join me in doing so. All right. So as I was already, as John already began um, telling the story, Sherman was born on April 19th, 1721 in Massachusetts. After the death of his father, he moved um, with his siblings and, and, and mother. He, he walked, I understand, to Connecticut, where he worked as a cobbler, a surveyor, and a store owner. Um, no, Sherman never went to college, but he was a, a voracious learner. He taught himself advanced mathematics, and in 1750, he began publishing a popular almanac, which he issued annually for a decade. 
He also taught himself law and was admitted to the Litchfield Bar in 1754. So as Sherman prospered professionally, he was selected for a variety of local offices and was elected to several, several terms in the lower house of Connecticut's General Assembly. In 1760, after the death of his first wife, with whom he had seven children, he moved to New Haven and opened a store next to Yale College. Um, there he married Rebecca Prescott about three years later, and the two had eight children, which is 15 children, if you're counting. And during these years, he was appointed as an elder in his church, which was not a trivial matter in Congregational New England, and he served for many years as Yale's treasurer. In 1766, Connecticut voters elected Sherman to be one of 12 members of the upper house of the Connecticut legislature. Traditionally, four assistants were selected by the General Assembly to serve with the deputy governor as judges on Connecticut Superior Court. Sherman was appointed to this court in 1766, and he held both offices, that is serving in the upper house and serving on the court until 1785, where, when he was forced to resign from the legislature. And as was already noted, he served as the first mayor of New Haven from 1784 until his death in 1793. All right, so beginning with the Stamp Act crisis of 1765, Sherman was a consistent opponent of what he considered to be Parliament's abuse of power. His views were recorded well by John Adams, who, after meeting Sherman for the first time, recorded in his diary that Sherman is, quote, a solid, sensible man, that he had read Mr. Otis's rights and et cetera in 1764, and thought that he, that is Otis, conceded away the rights of Americans. He thought the reverse of the Declaratory Act was true, namely that Parliament, the Parliament of Great Britain had authority to make laws for America in no cases whatsoever. Now, this is a very advanced position at the point. Other Americans eventually came to it, James Wilson, Thomas Jefferson, um, John Adams, and yet Sherman was articulating this at least as early as any of those folks. So of particular concern to Sherman, and this is something a lot of the history books mentions nowadays, uh, there was a concern that uh, for Sherman and his New England col colleagues that the crown, that the king would restrict the colonist freedom of religion by appointing an Anglican bishop for North America. This fear was reinforced by the Stamp Act, which contained a reference to courts exercising ecclesiastical jurisdiction within the colonies. Sherman and his colleagues were also troubled by the Quebec Act of 1774. The act extended the colony of Quebec into what is now the American Midwest, permitting the use of French civil law and allowing Catholics to practice their faith and take oaths without reference to Protestantism. To the New England mind, these steps represented a significant retreat for the kingdom of God in North America. The seriousness with which Sherman took the perceived Catholic threat is evident from a 1766 letter where he asked, and here I'm quoting, if the secession according to the present establishment should cease for want of an heir, or if the parliament should alter it and admit a papist to the crown, would not the colonies be at liberty to join with Britain or not? Now, you have to recognize in this era, Calvinism reigned supreme in New England, especially. Well over 80% of Americans, uh, uh, new people in New England are Calvinists to one degree or another. And the Calvinists were profoundly suspicious of the Roman Catholic Church. So these acts of parliament to ex extend Catholic power, although probably prudential, and I don't think there was any sort of um, conspiracy involved, it was still raising, uh, uh, raising alarm bells. Let's put it that way. All right, so heretofore we've seen Sherman being incredibly active in Connecticut politics, but beginning in 1774, he accepted multiple appointments to the Continental Congress. Here, he helped draft and sign the Declaration of Resolves, which among other things stipulated that colonists had, quote, by the immutable laws and nature, the principles of the English Constitution and the several charters or compacts they are entitled to life, liberty, and property, and they have never ceded any sovereign power whatsoever, a right to dispose of either without their consent. Now, this Congress went on to assert that Parliament had no authority to tax the colonies, although to Sherman's chagrin, it conceded that it could regulate colonial trade. 
It is a token of esteem in which his colleagues held him that in 1776, Sherman was the only delegate appointed to all of the three most important congressional committees. First of all, and we forget about this committee, but it really was the most important at the time, the Board of War, which was charged with directing the war effort. It was indisputably the most important committee. The other two committees we have come to recognize as being important. The second committee was a five-person committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Um, fellow members included Adams and Jefferson and Franklin and Robert Livingston. And then finally, he was appointed to the first committee to draft the nation's first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Now, I want you to think about that a minute. Jefferson was only on one committee, the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Sherman was the only one on three. I think if you were to ask anyone in the Continental Congress in 1776, who are the real powerful delegates, who are the delegates that are respected the most, Sherman would be at the very top. Someone like Thomas Jefferson, always far more eloquent than Sherman ever was, he wasn't considered to be as important. That's why he was only on one of these committees and he was able to take a stab at drafting the Declaration of Independence, which we associate with him, of course, although the other members of the committee um, made contributions and it's hard to know exactly who did what in the final analysis. In the final analysis, the Declaration is a product of a committee. First is committee of five, and then the Continental Congress as a whole, because they changed the committee's draft in ways that Jefferson did not like. I say that not to take anything away from Thomas Jefferson. I went to Mr. Jefferson's university. I respect that founder. I'm just trying to suggest that sometimes we focus on some very few elite, bright thinkers, and we can neglect the influence of someone like a Sherman who is maybe not as good at oratory and who never became president. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, this is really cool, if you ask me. So um, shortly after independence, 1783 specifically, Sherman and the aptly named Richard Law accepted the task of revising all of Connecticut statutes. They worked on their project throughout the summer and fall of 1783, and the General Assembly approved the revisions with a few changes in 1784. Now, these revisions were particularly important because they're the first systematic review of the state's laws to be made without the oversight of Great Britain. Among Sherman's contributions was a religious liberty statute entitled An Act for Securing the Rights of Conscience in Matters of Religion to Christians of Every Denomination in the State. Now, even the title will suggest that, um, you know, this isn't maybe a, as robust of a religious liberty statute as we would want to see today because it applies only to Christians. I think in Sherman's defense that it's probably the case that 99.99% of white citizens in Connecticut would have called themselves, would have identified themselves as Christians. In fact, I'm not sure there were any non-Christians of European descent. I just said 99.99% to be safe. All right, so the religious liberty statute did not separate church and state in Connecticut in any modern sense of that phrase. The preamble, which was penned by Sherman, begins as follows. As the happiness of a people and the good order of civil society essentially depend upon piety, religion, and morality, it is a duty of civil authority to provide for support and encouragement thereof, that is, of religion. The revised statutes retained provisions funding the Congregational Church, and although Protestant dissenters were either excused from ecclesiastical taxes or allowed to direct them to their own congregations, um, as well, town leaders were instructed to supply Bibles and a suitable number of Orthodox catechisms and other good books of practical godliness to families in need. In some, the civil state very much remained a nursing father to the church. Now, compared to Thomas Jefferson's famous 1786 Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, Sherman's Religious Liberty Statute is unknown. Almost no one knows it. The former, that is Jefferson's law, has been regularly cited by the Supreme Court and is often discussed by scholars and popular authors writing on the First Amendment. But why? There is no evidence that the framers of the First Amendment looked to Jefferson's statute as a model, and unlike Jefferson, Sherman actually participated in the debates over the First Amendment. If we're interested in the founders' views of church-state relations, it would seem that Connecticut statutes and those of other states should be considered alongside of Virginia's. 
Now, there's another important contrast between Thomas Jefferson and Roger Sherman. Roger Sherman never owned an enslaved person. And in fact, he was a lifelong opponent of slavery. So in the same year that he was drafting these laws, he um, wrote a pamphlet in part to defend the Articles of Confederation and in part to defend the right of Native Americans. In doing so, he quoted Acts 17.26, which reads, that God hath made of one blood all nations of the earth and have determined the bounds of their habitation, a passage regularly used by abolitionists. I want you to know the first part of that, that verse, that God hath made of one blood all nations of the earth. Around this time, and then particularly in the late 18th, early 19th century, we're beginning to see scientific racists arise, and they're anything but scientific, right? And they argue based on quote-unquote science that somehow humanity had multiple origins, and these multiple origins led to the African-American race, the white race, the, the, the Asian race. Um, Sherman would have nothing to do with this. Everyone descends from Adam and Eve. God hath made of one blood all the nations of the earth. Now, this is particularly relevant for um, enslaved people in, a, in, in Connecticut because Sherman's 1783 revisions of Connecticut law included a statute requiring the emancipation of all children born to enslaved persons after March 1st, 1784. So let me, let me concede that Connecticut's Gradual Emancipation Act did not immediately free any slaves, but it sped the decline of slavery in the state. Between 1790 and 1800, the number of slaves dropped from 2,764 to 951. Some, probably only a few slaves, might have been shipped out of state. And so the legislature prohibited that practice in 1788 with respect to children entitled to their freedom at age 25 and for all enslaved persons in 1792. Sherman was not in the legislature when these acts were passed, uh, but they illustrate the significant opposition to slavery that had developed in the state. Uh, by 1820, there were fewer than 100 slaves in Connecticut. And when the state finally abolished slavery altogether, in um, 1848, the number had dropped to 17. And Connecticut's not the only state that, that's doing this, right? Between 1776 and 1804, eight states either immediately abolished slavery or put it on the road to extinction. These gradual emancipation laws are, 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 were, were far and away the ways most states chose to address the evil of slavery. Now, let me immediately say a gradual emancipation law is not as good as immediate emancipation, but it's a heck of a lot better than no emancipation law at all. Well, let's shift gears and go down to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention. In 1787, Sherman was appointed along with Oliver Ellsworth and William Samuel Johnson to represent Connecticut in the Federal Constitutional Convention. Ellsworth, incidentally, was 20 years younger than Sherman, and he had reportedly declared that Sherman was his role model. Upon hearing this, John Adams stated that was praise enough for both men. Now, no delegate at the convention had more experience in the national government than Roger Sherman, and only one member, Benjamin Franklin, had more experience at any level. Franklin was the oldest member of the convention, Sherman the second oldest. And yet, in spite of his age, Sherman spoke more times than all but three members of the convention, and he participated in all of the most important debates. So Sherman arrived in Philadelphia convinced that Congress's powers needed to be strengthened, particularly with respect to raising money and managing commerce and currency. But he was a firm supporter of local and limited government, and so was shocked by Madison's proposals for a legislature based upon proportional representation and a national government with a general grant of powers and the ability to veto state laws. Sherman tenaciously fought each of these provisions, eventually winning equal representation for the states and the Senate and enumeration of Congress's powers. I'm thinking here about Article 1, Section 8 and the elimination of the national government's ability to veto state laws. Sherman's most important contribution in, at the Constitutional Convention was a great or the Connecticut Compromise. When it became apparent that the large states would not accept retaining the Articles of Confederation provision for one state, one vote, and that small states would not agree to proportional representation alone, Sherman returned to an idea similar to one he had proposed in the Continental Congress. 
that membership in the House of Representatives be proportionally allocated based on state population and that each state be represented equally in the Senate and that senators be chosen by the state legislatures. His compromise was eventually accepted. Once Madison and Wilson were forced to concede equal representation of the states in the Senate and an enumeration of Congress's powers, they, they began to push for a stronger executive. Sherman, who distrusted concentrated powers in any institution, again fought them with vigor. He would have required the president to work in conjunction with the council. Uh, he would have opposed giving him a veto, and he fought every attempt to give him prerogative powers. That is the sort of powers the king had. Sherman even opposed giving presidents an unqualified pardon power, arguing for Senate confirmation of pardons. Now, Sherman, as you might recognize, lost a lot of these battles with respect to executive power, although he helped eliminate the absolute veto in some of the prerogative powers that a number of his fellow delegates were willing to give the president, including the power to declare war. Um, let me just say, incidentally, as a, um, as a big Congress guy, I, I think if Sherman had won more of these battles over presidential power, um, we would have engaged in far fewer military adventures abroad in the 20th and into the 21st century. All right, so Sherman firmly believed that the national government's power should be limited. And he was successful in helping create a constitution that restrained the scope of national government's power well into the 20th century. Regardless of the merits of this position, one thing is certain. If Madison had convinced the convention to propose a constitution where representation was based solely on population, and with a national government that could veto state laws, and which had a general grant of power, it is inconceivable that it would have been ratified by, by more than four or five states. I'm referring here to the Virginia plan. If the convention had approved the Virginia plan, no way it could ratify. Sherman's, to the, Sherman's contributions to the federal convention were neglected for many years, but scholars have recently gained a better appreciation of them. For instance, David Robertson argues in a 2005 article published in the American Political Science Review, that's my discipline's top journal, um, he said that Sherman often outmaneuvered Madison at the Constitutional Convention, and he suggests that, quote, the political synergy between Madison and Sherman may well have been necessary for the Constitution's adoption. Similarly, Jack Rakoff concludes his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Original Meanings, that he concludes in it that, quote, America has had more Shermans in its politics than Madison's, and arguably too few of either. But it was a rivalry between their competing goals and political styles that jointly gave the great convention much of its drama and fascination, and also permitted its achievement. Let me again here just retreat a little bit and suggest that James Madison is often called the father of the Constitution. And I don't begrudge him that title. If we have to say who is the most important delegate, it probably is Madison. And yet the Constitution that came out of Philadelphia was a group effort. And if Sherman had not been there to battle with Madison, and if anti-federalists hadn't been there to battle with the Federalists, we would have come out with something very different out of Philadelphia, probably something that would not have been ratified. So when we, when we want to understand the meaning of the Constitution and the original understanding of the Constitution, we just have to look beyond James Madison to folks like Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, and others. All right, so after the convention, Sherman returned to Connecticut, where he wrote seven newspaper essays defending the Constitution. He was elected to represent New Haven at the State Ratification Convention, where, according to one account, quote, all of the objections to the Constitution vanished before the learning and eloquence of Johnson, the genuine good sense and discernment of Sherman, and the Dalmatian energy of Ellsworth. The reporter may have been biased, but the sense of Federalist domination is evident, as we can tell from the 128 to 40 vote to ratify the Constitution. Connecticut thus became the fifth state to ratify the document. In 1788, Sherman was elected to the House of Representatives. And in 1791, he was appointed to the US Senate to fill the unexpected, unexpired term of William Samuel Johnson. In Congress, he played important roles in arguments over the tariffs, the assumption of state debts, and the creation of the National Bank. Most notably, despite his objection to adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution, he joined in debates over it and served on all of the relevant House committees. In 
After Madison's speech introducing possible amendments, Sherman was appointed to the 11 person House Committee that re reported constitutional conventions to the full House. Ironically, given his opposition to adding constitutional amendments, the only draft of the Bill of Rights that we have in handwriting is in his own hand. Think about that. The only handwritten draft of the Bill of Rights was penned by Roger Sherman. After initial debates in the House, Sherman was appointed to a three-person committee charged with preparing an introduction for an arrangement of the Articles of Amendment, a committee on what Madison did not serve. He later joined Madison and John, John Vining on the conference committee that reconciled the House and the Senate versions of the Bill of Rights. It is worth noting that heading the Senate's delegation to the conference committee was none other than Sherman's protege, Oliver Ellsworth. Madison originally proposed interspersing amendments throughout the Constitution. Think about that. Uh, the First Amendment could have been art in Article I, the Second Amendment in Article Three, and that sort of thing. But Sherman objected, saying that this would be like, quote, mixing brass, iron, and clay. He eventually convinced his colleagues to place the amendments at, after the original text, as they are today. Madison had also insisted on including an, an amendment stipulating that, quote, no state shall infringe the equal rights of conscience, nor the freedom of speech or of the press, nor the right to trial by jury in criminal cases. This restriction on the states, which Madison conceived to be, quote, the most valuable amendment on the whole list, was defeated. I mentioned these two examples here to emphasize that the Bill of Rights did not leap fully formed out of Madison's brow. It was a product of many minds, including forgotten founders like Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, Fisher Ames, Elias Boudinot, Charles Carroll, and William Patterson, to name only a few of the members of Congress who helped craft this key document. Scholars and jurists interested in the original intent of those who wrote the First Amendment's religion clause consider a variety of sources. They need to, they need to do that. Uh, other than the records of the debates over the amendments themselves, what better source than the words and deeds of representatives and senators who wrote the amendment? A good example of a relevant act may be found the day after, literally the day after the House approved the final wording of the Bill of Rights. Elias Boudinot, a representative from New Jersey and later president of the American Bible Society, proposed that the president recommend a day of public thanksgiving and prayer in response to objections by Adonis Burke and Thomas Tucker that such a practice mimicked European customs or should be done by the states. Sherman was recorded as quote, justifying the practice of thanksgiving on any single event, not only as a lot of one in itself, but as warranted by a number of precedents in holy writ, that is the Bible. For instance, the solemn thanksgiving and rejoicing which took place in the time of Solomon after the building of the temple was a case in point. This example, he thought, worthy of Christian imitation on the present occasion, and he would agree with the gentleman who moved the resolution. So the House agreed with Boudinot and Sherman. Um, they appointed those two and Peter Sylvester to a committee to communicate with their counterparts in the Senate. Congress eventually requested George Washington to issue his famous 1789 Thanksgiving Day proclamation. It's a wonderful proclamation. Just Google it and read it tonight, Washington 1789 Thanksgiving Day proclamation. Now I mention this because it helps to make an important point. In the 1947 Establishment Clause case of Everson versus the Board of Education, Justice Wiley Rutledge observed that, quote, no provision of the Constitution is more closely tied to or given content by its generating history than the Religion Clause of the First Amendment. It is at once a refined product and a terse summation of that history. Now, in this opinion, Rutledge made 62 distinct historical references including 11 to Thomas Jefferson, 28 to James Madison, but none at all to Roger Sherman. Other justices have followed suit. So since 1947, justices have made 189 distinct appeals to James Madison, 112 to Jefferson, and only three to Roger Sherman. Now, this strikes me as remarkable, given that Sherman was intimately involved in drafting the First Amendment, and Jefferson was not even in America at the time. And my point, again, is as brilliant as Jefferson and Madison are, we just simply have to expand the, con the conversation to look at founders like Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, Elias Boudinot, and others if we really want to understand the original 
uh, meaning of the First Amendment. All right, well, let's um, press on a little bit and return to Roger Sherman. Sherman, as you all know, remained active in politics until his death on July 23, 1793. At this time, he was regarded as one of America's greatest statesmen. For instance, John Adams described Sherman to his wife as, quote, that old Puritan, as honest as an angel and as firm in the cause of American independence as Mount Atlas. A number of years later, in 1822, Adams wrote to John Sanderson that Sherman was, quote, one of the most cordial friends which I ever had in my life, destitute of all literary and scientific education, but such as he acquired by his own exertions. He was one of the most sensible men in the world. He had the clearest head and the steadiest heart, one of the soundest and strongest pillars of, of the revolution. Patrick Henry remarked late in life that Sherman and George Mason were the greatest statesmen he ever knew. Now I could go on and there's a number of other um, wonderful quotes I could give you, but let me just uh, assert Sherman was respected by his peers. And so this race is a question, why do people besides the folks in this great audience, why do Americans as a whole, and I mean, I'm talking even uh, educated Americans, Americans who read books, why do they not know who Sherman is? Well, let me go and get, go on to give a couple of reasons. First of all, Sherman died relatively um, early in our new republic. He didn't go on to play a major role in the new republic. Um, we tend to know founders who went on to hold very important national office, especially the presidency, right? Think about it, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all became president of the United States. Of course, Franklin, or of course, Sherman died too early to do that. He wouldn't have been elected president anyway, but dying early in the New Republic certainly didn't help. Um, someone like you know, Alexander Hamilton, we know, of course, because he was such a flashy person and played such a key role in the new national government. The only exception to the, this rule, I think, has been Franklin, who also died early in the um, New Republic. And yet, of course, he's such an extraordinary person, such a fascinating story um, that I think that helps explain it. So Sherman, he died a bit too early in the um, New Republic because he was so old, right? He was born far earlier before almost any founder except for, except for Franklin. Secondly, and this is very important, Sherman left relatively few papers with which scholars can work. Um, Liberty Fund Press published about a decade ago a one volume edited edition of his papers that I edited. And it contains literally every interesting speech he gave, essay he wrote, and that sort of thing. One volume. Whereas when you look at the papers of even an Alexander Hamilton, who died way too young, I think there's something like 35 volumes. The Adams family papers are going to be over 100 volumes by the time they're done. Um, Washington papers, Madison papers, dozens and dozens. Scholars can work with these papers, whereas with Sherman, you have a lot less with which to work. Um, as well, I want to suggest that Sherman was not a radical thinker or a stirring orator like Thomas Jefferson was, I think it's fair to say. Indeed, though, he brought much needed common sense to constitutional bodies. In the Constitutional Convention, Robert Yates reported him as commenting, I am not fond of speculation. I would rather proceed on experimental ground, which by he meant on the grounds of experience. Similarly, in an essay defending the proposed constitution, Sherman wrote, philosophy may mislead you, ask experience. My um, favorite story is when a young representative asked why Sherman was not giving a speech uh, about an issue that he was interested in. Sherman responds simply, minorities talk, majorities vote. There's no need to give a speech if you got the votes lined up, right? And then finally, I want to suggest that many of Sherman's opinions are unfashionable today. Throughout my talk, I emphasize that Sherman did not share a modern understanding of the separation of church and state. Because of this, many writers who today, or jurists who favor a strict separation of church and state, don't like to go to founders like Sherman. They prefer, they much prefer to go to Jefferson and Madison because these two founders embraced a greater degree of separation between church and state than a founder like Sherman, Ellsworth, and others. All right. So famous founders like Franklin, Jefferson, Madison, and Hamilton are indisputably brilliant, eloquent, and influential. However, they do not necessarily represent the founders' views well. As a historical matter, 
if we want to consider the most interesting or progressive founders, it makes sense to focus on them. But if, as a matter of history, we want to understand the founders as a body, it is necessary to move beyond these fascinating few. We have to um, consider people like Sherman and Ellsworth and Boudinot, and I keep going on and on, but it's Sherman's birthday, so we'll focus on that. Let me quote with a um, early 19th century reflection by Yale President Timothy Dwight. Um, he wrote of Mr. Sherman, he called him Mr. Sherman, Mr. Sherman possessed a powerful mind and habits of industry, which no difficulties could discourage and no toil impair. In early life, he began to apply himself with inextinguishable zeal to the acquisition of knowledge. In this pursuit, he was always actively engaged in business. He spent more hours than most of those who were professedly students. In his progress, he became extensively acquainted with mathematical science, with natural philosophy, with moral and metaphysical philosophy, with history, logic, and theology. As an attorney and a statesman, he was eminent. The late Judge Ingersoll, who had, who's already been mentioned once, once observed to me that, in his opinion, the views of Mr. Sher the views which Mr. Sherman formed of political subjects were more powerful, just, and comprehensive than those of almost any other man with whom he had become acquainted on this continent. His mind was remarkably clear and penetrating, and more than almost any other man, looked from the beginning of a subject to the end. Nothing satisfied him but proof, or that where that was impossible, the predominant probability, which equally controls the conduct of a wise man. He had no fashionable opinions and could never be persuaded to swim with the tide. Oh, would we not have more statesmen like this nowadays, and stateswomen? Independent of everything but argument, he judged for himself and rarely failed to convince others that he judged right. I hope you all join me in celebrating the 300th anniversary of Sherman's birth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such an informative and insightful presentation. We seem to have many descendants of Roger Sherman viewing with us tonight, and I'm hoping that they might start posting some of their uh, family history in the chat. But for now, the few things that have come in were we have a New Haven teacher who mentioned that when she was growing up, she learned all about Roger Sherman in the New Haven Public Schools. But apparently it's no longer being taught since when she questioned her ninth graders, none of them really knew who he was. And she feels that it should, local history in particular, should really be a requirement. I agree 100%. And all sorts of local history. Sherman's more important than many, but you know, all towns have great stories that ought to be remembered. Uh, we had someone else that wrote, uh, it seems that many streets, parks, and towns are named for Roger Sherman. And they were wondering if he, in fact, lived throughout Connecticut, or if it was merely paying uh, homage for his outstanding achievements. You know, that's a great question, and one I'm not really capable of answering. I bet John, who was um, here earlier, would be better. Um, for sure, to my understanding, New Milford and um, New Haven were the main places he lived. I think sometimes, um, you know, as, as we get past the Civil War, um, William could come to Sherman. Um, a lot of towns were named after him in the Midwest and elsewhere. So I don't know. You know, I looked a little. My my, my um, book, Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic, pretty well ends with Sherman's death and some reflections on his legacy. Um, so I know he had a lot of great descendants, uh, and, and numerous, and very influential and important in Connecticut politics and Massachusetts politics. Um, great advocates for liberty, like James uh, Roger Sherman Baldwin and others, but I just never really um, spent much time studying that sort of thing. Uh, someone else would like to know if any of the houses that Sherman actually lived in, are they still in existence? Uh, again, John probably could help me out here. I know for sure I've been to New Haven and you can go to um, one of his houses that is now a restaurant or something like that. Does that sound familiar to New Haven residents? So I'll jump in here. Um, 
the Union League Cafe is on the spot where Sherman's house stood until the early 1900s. And um, I learned yesterday um, uh, that there is the, an extant house up in New Milford. Um, it's not operated by the Historical Society, it's privately owned, but again, if you contact New Milford Historical Society, it could tell you more about that. Someone else is wondering if Roger Sherman knew Jonathan Edwards. Roger Sherman was a huge fan of Jonathan Edwards Sr. Jonathan Edwards Jr. was the um, was a minister at his church. And Jonathan Edwards Jr., like his daddy, had a tendency to make his um, parishioners mad at him. And it's reported that he only held on as long as he did because Jonathan Edwards Jr. had the support of Roger Sherman. In his library, there's a very nice list of the books he owned. I believe he owned all of the books that had been published um, at his death by Jonathan Edwards Sr. So yeah, he was well-read in theology and he cared deeply about um, Calvinism, I think even more specifically. We have an audience member who says Roger Sherman was her five times great grandfather and she believes her granddaughter is in attendance tonight as well. And someone else is wondering how much time did Roger Sherman spend in Philadelphia and Washington thinking about those 15 children at home? <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, I've wondered that as, as well. And some of his children, especially from his first marriage, did not turn out as well as I'm sure he would have liked. Yeah, he was gone from home quite a bit. The... Um, yeah, he really was uh, serving wherever wherever the Continental Congress happened to, to meet. He, of course, died before Washington, D.C. came online. And so places at uh, first federal Congress met in New York City and then Philadelphia. So they were a bit more um, accessible to him. But yeah, away from home quite a bit. I think that's that's very fair and maybe even a fair critique. We have somebody who says that they are a great granddaughter times six and her dad is watching tonight and thanks you for this. And someone else who grew up in Sherman, Connecticut says that students there do learn about Roger Sherman. Thank goodness. No, they should. Yeah, for the life of me, I think every school child in Connecticut at least should learn about him. He's um, you know, one, one of the greatest statesmen ever produced by, by your fine state. There are others, of course, but one of the greatest. Another audience member says they're embarrassed to say that they're near 50 and never even knew of Sherman's significance. Thank you so much for hosting this important story and contribution of our history. Someone else is asking, are there any letters or correspondence between Madison and Sherman? There, there are a few, and I'll try to, I'll try to reconstitute this in my mind. I hope I can get it right. When um, th there is an extensive correspondence, but when they were debating the constitutionality of the bank, the um, how did it go? Sherman passes a note to Roger to James Madison, basically highlighting the fact that. Congress has only enumerated powers and powers not enumerated don't belong to Congress. And Madison handed it back with a little carroted in expressly, suggesting that there are implied powers as well. I botched that story. It's in my Roger Sherman book. And that document is reprinted in the collected works of Roger Sherman, which incidentally, that might sound like, a, like an esoteric scholarly work. It's published by Liberty Fund Press. I think you can order it for like $12.50 on Amazon if you have Amazon Prime and you can get all you want to read of Roger Sherman. Someone else would like to know about Sherman's second wife. Do we know anything about her? You know, I just don't know that much about her. I, I'm more of an intellectual historian, so I was very much uh, you know, dealing with the ideas and its debates and that sort of thing. Chris Collier has uh, the, the best biography of Sherman. And so that's where I would go to find out information about her. I do not recall that he provides all that much information, though. So that might be a subject, actually, a fine subject for someone looking for a research project. 
What caused Sherman to pass away? Was it a health issue? You know, I think it was just old age. I forget exactly. Um, well, we could probably do the math, right? 70, so 70, early 70s something. Um, yeah, I'm sure it was a health issue, and I don't remember. Maybe Chris Collier would uh, would give an explanation, but I think it was just simply old age. And, and of course, in this era, without medical technology that we have today, he lived to a ripe old age. Um, someone said that in Plainfield, New Jersey, they know all about Roger Sherman because his great great grandson was a World War I U.S. Army camouflage officer. All right, super. And another said Connecticut should require local history. It used to, it defines us and gives us perspective. And they are a descendant of Theopolis Eaton. And that, let's see, we have a fifth great grandson descended through his eldest son. You are right, his son did not turn out well. And did Sherman have a productive period as the mayor of New Haven? You know, I'm not sure, honestly. I, um, you know, it, it, it kind of is mind boggling nowadays with all of the documents we produce, but so much of his service largely went unrecorded or um, not very well recorded. There might be more documents than I know of. I, I primarily focused on the debates in the federal convention and the continental congress the first federal congress i was kind of looking at that that level of debate but it, it might well be worthwhile to look into what he was actually able to do as the mayor of new haven barbara thinks someone needs to produce sherman the musical <laughs> yeah please make my book into that um, <laughs> that did real well for the Chernow biography of hamilton and in the Yale Library with notice, you can view a lot of original correspondence. Uh, they did this along with their parents a few years ago. It's awesome being able to touch what he touched and they recommend that for any descendants. Uh, someone else said that Sherman's gravesite can be visited in the Grove Cemetery along with other notable figures in New Haven. And let's see, there's an annual event at the Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven to honor the signers of the Declaration of Independence, including Sherman. And why did you, Mr. Hall, decide to research Roger Sherman? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. As a graduate student, I was very interested in the, in the American founders in general. And um, I, I, I particularly kind of latched onto a guy named James Wilson of, Phil, of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who was from Scotland originally. And one of the practical things, and this is uh, advice for any budding scholar out there, there are just literally thousands of books on George Washington, hundreds of books on, on probably thousands on Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton and Franklin. And so it's real hard to do anything new, whereas someone like James Wilson is relatively unknown. There were maybe five books on him. And so I was able to go and learn those books, learn the sources and craft a, um, I, I think, useful argument. And that was my first book. And so reading about the debates uh, in the federal convention, especially, I just always liked Sherman. He seemed to be one of the more sensible of the founders, as I said earlier, someone who wanted a stronger national government, but was very wary of concentrated power. And so his ideas were attractive to me. And he falls into that same category as James Wilson. You know, there were a few biographies, including Chris Collier's great biography of him, uh, but there was still a lot of work. Okay? Really no student of political theory, which is what I am, had done a book on him to be sure, and not really even much by way of articles. And so I just plowed in there and again, learned everything he did pretty much at the national level, at the state level, um, put him in the context of the literature and wrote a book where I highlight his contributions to the creation of the American Republic, arguing as well that he represents a, a strain of Calvinist political thought that is oftentimes neglected because we're always focusing on those Anglican founders, the Jefferson, a, a, a Madison, a Washington, it's true Adams is a Congregationalist of sorts, but he's not a very good Calvinist. So I think Sherman allows us to see 
the political culture of New England in a way that is helpful uh, far more broadly than with Sherman. How did the representatives in Philadelphia know about him when he first sh showed up there in 1774 and they elected him? Yeah, this is a great point. So he shows up in um, yeah, 1774, that's right. With, yeah, you know, that's a really good question. How much of a national reputation did he have? Um, I, I think right away it, became, it would be, uh, become clear he's a very sensible guy, a guy on our side in terms of being a patriot. And I, my sense is he probably just impressed the heck out of folks so that by the time we get to 1776, it's in 1776 he's appointed to these three really cool committees. And then again, I, I gave you probably six quotations. I could have kept going. I, just almost everyone who commented on Sherman, the most critical thing that I forget who said it, but someone said he's not a very eloquent speaker, which I think is true. He was not an eloquent speaker, but everyone else commented on what a clear mind, what a um, crafty legislator. Um, you want to be on his side. If you're in a legislative fight, you want to be on Sherman's side, to be sure. Someone mentioned that uh, they heard that he, they heard you say he defended Indians and did not own slaves. What political legislation did he sponsor to support these groups? So actually, and I was specifically asked to say um, something about Sherman and Native Americans. He had almost no immediate interaction with them. It was not like he was out negotiating with them, to my knowledge. Um, no national legislation or Connecticut legislation. So actually very little. So it's this one pamphlet where the primary burden of the pamphlet is to defend the Articles of Confederation. But in the course of doing so, he defends the rights of Native Americans to own property and by the, the same token to sell property. And some of this has to do with the Wyoming Valley controversy, to be sure. What I found to be of interest, and one reason I highlighted that, is it allowed me to highlight and quote that passage from Acts 17, which was used by abolitionists all the time, right? They wanted to emphasize that we are all of one blood, and therefore um, we are all deserving of liberty. Throughout his career, Sherman, wherever it was appropriate, fought for the liberty of enslaved people. And I think um, that needs to be honored today, especially today. Uh, the same person also feels that Hamilton and Sherman probably had a lot of disagreements and debates. Uh, if so, what might have been their biggest disagreement? Sherman wanted, or I'm sorry, Hamilton wanted a very powerful national government and a very powerful executive. Um, Sherman wanted a more powerful national government, but he wanted it to be strictly limited. And so he won a lot of the battles in the federal convention. We came out with the um, Article 1, Section 8 limitations on Congress's power, limitations that stayed in place more or less until the 1930s. We forget about that. Uh, beginning in the mid 30s, they kind of got blown apart. And now the national government can do almost anything it wants. So Sherman would have liked that result. Hamilton would not have liked it. Hamilton would be far happier with the national government that we have today. By the same token, um, Sherman lost a lot of the battles over the powers of the presidency. Hamilton wanted a far more powerful presidency. And so Hamilton would have been very happy with even what the president, the sort of power the president had in the 18th and 19th century, but then particularly the sort of power the president has come to assume in the 20th century. Hamilton would have liked that a lot more than Sherman would have. We had several people, including Margaret Ann, who think that he died of typhoid fever. All right, I will defer to that. that. That seems very plausible to me. And we have someone who said that he probably struggled as a Yankee down where politics in Virginia uh, were, were very much a thing. Now, I don't think he really went to Virginia. I think Philadelphia is probably about as south as he got, maybe um, yeah, New, New, New Jersey, Philadelphia. But yeah, I think sometimes he and the Southern politicians, it, it was a very different. In Virginia, you have elite planters who tend to be sent to these constitutional conventions and that sort of thing, right? They're really elite, really rich. They have lots of enslaved people serving under them. Sherman comes from this very common background. He didn't go to college. 
you know, he, he get, got some success in life, but he's certainly not an elite planter with all sorts of servant, uh, servants and that sort of thing. Yes, I think sometimes they definitely clashed. They did not get along um, as well as they might have. And yet Sherman was a master negotiator. He could put together coalitions and win a lot of important battles. Do you happen to know how many volumes did he did Sherman have in his personal library? There, if in my collected works of Roger Sherman, I leave a document that um, was from his estate when they were wrapping up his estate after he died. And I believe what it's, I think it was like 150 books. But then there was a second document that sort of categorized all sorts of pamphlets and printed sermons and other things. So a whole bunch of other printed stuff that were not that were not books. I think we have to be careful, you know, just as a lot of us do. Sometimes you might own books and then sell them when you're moving or that sort of thing. So we shouldn't assume those are the only 150 books that Sherman had. They were just the ones he had when he passed away. Do you know if Sherman had a view on the role of women in national politics? Yeah, this is a good question. I don't think Sherman um, questioned the um, the mores of the day. Women just were certainly not serving in um, elected capacity. You have a rare woman like a Mer Mercy Otis Warren who might write uh, on politics, oftentimes under a pseudonym, and Abigail Adams who might give advice to her husband. But yeah, he certainly was not advocating for um, equal rights for women. And this isn't really a defense of him, but I'll just say almost no one was in this era, in the late 18th century America. No one was out there saying women should be able to vote or hold elective office or that sort of thing. That really begins in the 1830s when you get the um, early, what was then called the women's rights movement activist. Um, according to the Virginians, uh, New England didn't have a block in the constitutional battles. That's from Rick. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, they didn't have a block. You mean they didn't always vote as a block? I believe that's what he meant. Yeah, I think it depends on the issues. Um, and you're exactly right. Sometimes, you know, the delegates from New York, they aren't really New England, right? But they're kind of up north. They had very different interests than the folks in New England. New York, of course, has wonderful deep water ports. Um, New England doesn't. They have ports, but not the deep water type ports. And so there's a real incentive to have a, a national taxing authority for importation, um, whereas New York did not like that. And so, yeah, there was all sorts of di disagreements. And I, I would hasten to say we tend to think in terms of North versus South, but there were great federalists from the South, right? At George Washington, at James Madison, there were great anti-federalists from the South, uh, Patrick Henry, at George Mason, and William Randolph. And um, you have anti-federalists and federalists from the North. Yes, yeah, so I think there are some regional issues that come up from time to time. The votes involving um, slavery, whether or not we're going to ban the importation of slaves or that's or the Fugitive Slave Clause and Three-Fifths Compromise, those did tend to have more regional leanings. Um, but even there, there was some disagreement. Uh, Margaret Ann has link, uh, posted the link for the Sherman family papers that are at our Whitney Library for people if they're interested. And uh, somebody said, what role did Oliver Ellsworth play in the Connecticut Compromise? Or, and also he what happened to all of uh, the almanacs? The almanacs, you can... Um you can find easily enough today. There's actually, I'm not sure if you can just go to any old library to find them, but definitely you go. I think I went to the um, Connecticut State Library and was able to download a PDFs of each and every one of them. So I have stored away on my computer these almanacs and they're physically available. Of course, their you know, archivists are going to maybe hesitate to let you handle them when you can read them electronically. So they're, so they're around. The Connecticut Compromise is oftentimes credited to both Oliver Ellsworth and Roger Sherman. And so I kind of slid over that. The two were a team. The two worked together. The two were almost always on the same side, not quite always. The um, Yeah, and I think Oliver Ellsworth is another one of those great Americans that is worthy of study who is all too often overlooked.
Can it be said that Sherman was a student of the writings of the Enlightenment? I would say he's first and foremost a Christian. He's a student of the Bible. He's a reader of Jonathan Edwards and other um, Puritan. Uh, Edwards isn't a Puritan, but of uh, Puritans like Richard Baxter and whatnot. Um, he did read some of the works in the Enlightenment. The I think it was the Library of Congress has yeah has a notebook where he was obviously reading Jean Jacques Rousseau's Social Contract and quoting, um, writing, you know, taking it's kind of kind of a commonplace book. So he was quoting passages from the social contract that he liked. So he definitely read some of that stuff, but I would say by far and away, very little. He was not a speculative sort of thinker. Someone like a Jefferson was reading that stuff all the time, not so much Sherman. And Sherman, again, I hope I don't leave the wrong impression. I would not claim him as a as a intellectual giant, certainly not the most well-read person in the room. He was so busy with his law practice, with his Connecticut politics, serving in the upper house, serving in the, the court, going down to Philadelphia, serving in the Con Continental Congress. I would say his real, um, he should be praised primarily as a man of action, as a practical, pragmatic person, who I think too, he did have principles to be sure. He did have principles, but yeah, he's not a great speculative thinker like a, um, like a Thomas Jefferson, most obviously. I don't see any other questions. However, before I bring Khalil back, I have my own personal question. And I'm just curious, uh, do you have any other uh, famous people that you'll be looking to research and write a book about in the future? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking me. Um, I've kind of gone in a little bit different of a direction. I, I think someone mentioned my last book was Did America Have a Christian Founding? Writing Broadly on Religion in the American Founding, Religious Liberty, Church-State Relations. So that book came out and has sold pretty well. And so that's inspired me to do a sequel to it. I did in that book, um, America's Great Christian Jurist, I had a chapter that looks at both Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth. So I get a little bit of work in on Ellsworth. Um, William Patterson of New Jersey strikes me as someone who certainly should have a, a, there's a good biography of him, but plenty of room for someone like me, maybe a younger Mark Hall to write a book, William Patterson and the Creation of the American Republic or something like that. Great. Well, thank you so much for such a great and informative presentation. I'll have Khalil come back and Margaret Ann. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Um, I'd like to also, uh, just everybody who would like to hear a little bit more, please join us on Thursday for historian Peter Malia, uh, who will be looking at New Haven's town records during the revolutionary era. Um, and he uh, will also be addressing um, a little bit about Roger Sherman in our local history, so. And, and this, this talk will be remaining up on our Facebook page. So if anybody missed it, you can pass it on and we'll put up links to it. So um, if you missed it or wanna go back and listen to any part of it, more than welcome to, it'll be on our Facebook page. Lots of thank you yous, Professor Hall. Thank you very much for having me. This is a great pleasure. Good night.